Good morning and welcome to a bright Sunday morning. I'm on another walk and this time I'm at Bramber. I'm at Bramber Castle or the remains of Bramber Castle. There isn't a great deal here to see but what there is is a lot of history and that's what I want to tell you about today. Bramber Castle one of the first Norman castles to be erected shortly after the Norman invasion of 1066, was built by William de Brose, a baron who accompanied William the Conqueror and fought at Hastings. He was rewarded with land in Sussex, and he built his castle as a centre of administration and to guard the important port at Stenning, which is close by. This large flint wall is really all that's left to give an indication of how impressive the castle must have been. It's part of the gatehouse, which originally was smaller and then was later enlarged to become a keep. It's 70 foot tall and 5 foot thick, made from flint and chalk, but it was probably encased in stone to make it impregnable. I'm standing in an area called the Bailey, a large enclosed area protected by a curtain wall. Much of that, sadly, has disappeared. In front of me is the Mott, on which the original stronghold would have stood. A Mott is a man-made hill. As you can see, trees and shrubbery have covered it, but fortunately it's still accessible. This wasn't built by the Normans, however. No, it's earlier than that. The Saxons had their stronghold at Bramber, well before the Normans invaded. Let's go up and have a look. It's a bit slippery up here, so I'm just going to be a little careful. How I climb up. It's about 30 foot or so high. Slowly getting to the top. A bit muddy. We had rain yesterday. Evidence I can see of a fire on the very top. Not a lot of space up here, but enough for a wooden stronghold of some description. People always assume that it was the, the Normans that brought the castles. And while they brought the masonry technology into England and Britain, we were building castles here. The, the Saxons mainly built in timber. And Mott and Bailey castles were fairly common around the country. The original mound here probably dug from an, uh, a, a defensive ditch which would have encircled this mott some 15 feet deep and um, or maybe more uh, which would have produced the, the mud for the mound. The actual, the whole of the area here is on a natural mound as well which is surrounded now by uh, the remains of a curtain wall which the Normans erected when they came in 1066. But the Saxons had their own administration for Britain when the Saxon kings were, were all trying to define what Britain was until, until King Alfred, really. So let's put a bit of a time frame on this as I stroll around. You had the Saxons who had their Mott and Bailey and some form of administration in 1066 the Normans invaded. One of the barons that came with the Normans was William de Burrose. And William de Burrose was responsible for Bramber Castle. The Saxon name, Bramber, was Brim Burr, a burr being a fortified place. And so consequently, over the years, of course, Brim Burr turned to Bramber. The Normans, being their dominant 
fighting force determined to take over Britain and make it their own, which of course they did, erected much stronger, much more impressive and much impregnable castles. These are amazing walls, big, thick, chunky walls of flint and rubble, mainly chalk. Um, they were probably faced, I imagine, with some sort of facing stone just to make them even more impregnable. They're quite, um, they appear quite low at the moment. They would have risen a lot higher. As I walk round, I'm stunned by the, the beauty of the surrounding place. I'm looking here now towards the east and not too far from here, um, about a quarter of a mile, I guess, is the river, the River Ada. And then beyond, you can see the downs, defensive downs. Back then, the River Ada may not have been in the same place it is now because rivers moved. And also, the whole area was probably um, much more marshy, a, a morass of water and marsh and pretty, pretty unpleasant to wade through, which added to the defence of this particular area. Here, as I come now, have basically the remains, I think, of the living quarters the main living quarters. I mean, there may have been timber huts, timber buildings, timber framed um, cottages and various halls and things over the years. But uh, in terms of masonry, probably from the original period that the building was built, and I can't say for sure, um, we have these rather fascinating little bits of hall and room, which of course would have been topped with timber, giving out to terrific views across the east plains of Sussex. So from the gatehouse here, and later keep, onto the bridge that either went across the moat or the defensive ditch, and I'm going to go and venture down into what's left of the defensive ditch that surrounds this natural prominence coming down into the into the lower ditch which of course would have been lower now it is believed that it was filled with water I read an account that it was fed by a local stream from the River Ada, and so that's not completely uh, impossible to believe. It's quite an amazing trench that uh, would have had to have been dug. I'm always impressed by these great earthworks which were made by, by many hundreds of men using the primitive tools. It's now pretty much overgrown. But you can imagine that a, a formidable moat like this would have made getting it across quite a tricky business for any invading uh, armies. And of course, um, you might think, well, who would, who would be wanting to attack? Well, once the barons had got established, they often fell out with each other and they were all craving power. And so very often barons were challenged for their land and rights and various things. The human nature is greed, anger, and uh, <laughs> I don't think they negotiated much. I think the sword, the sword did all the negotiations. But if I angle myself around here and look up, you can see there's quite a height there before you get up. And then there's the curtained wall that would have prevented you getting easy access. So even if it wasn't a moat and it was just literally a ditch, which in many ways would be tough enough um, to get down into the ditch and then climb up when you're obviously 
open to attack from arrows and whatever other weaponry that the, the Normans would have had. And then when they, when they became more English, uh, that the English would have had. Here again, you can sort of get a measure of the steepness of the slopes and they would have been designed to be as absolutely steep as possible. But I think this is not only, not only is it um, steep there to sort of stop people, but I think also, as I have mentioned before, it's, it's that dominance in the landscape, it's the power that these uh, Normans, these barons, are relating to the world around them. We are in charge. We are your superiors. You will submit to our laws. And of course, people had no choice. They had to do it. It is pretty lush down here. And even now, coming down a thousand odd years later, it's very impressive. I love going out on these sort of walks around history. And of course, you can't go anywhere in Britain without en engaging with history. I mean, it's, it's basically probably not a square inch that, that does not have some historic reference. And that's what makes these walks these explorations fascinating for me and hopefully for the viewer. Back in the Victorian period the castle became a bit of a, a novelty and a place for people to go for picnics. Um, they erected tea rooms and so people would come from fair distance and uh, pay to come up into the bailey onto the green there and enjoy the views enjoy the countryside, the fresh air of course, and, and, um, and take tea on the bailey. If you go back further in time to around the English Civil War, there was uh, some skirmishes here between the, the Roundheads and the Cavaliers, and in fact it was after King Charles I had been beheaded, his son was um, making his way back trying to escape Charles II, trying to make his way to France. And he'd come down from the Midlands and was um, on what's now a, a route called the Monarch's Way. And he came past Bramber towards Shoreham, where he got a boat and managed to escape. But at that time, this place was full of uh, parliamentarians and he didn't want anybody to know, so he was in disguise and he went past. There was a gun emplacement, um, some cannons and, and what have you, I believe, fixed up into the church here. The, the rest of the, ch the uh, castle thereafter started to fall into um, ruin due to subsidence mostly. And consequently, the, uh, the stonework was pinched by uh, landowners to build houses and uh, also to help build the roads in the area. At the foot of the castle is the village of Bramber, a beautiful place with fabulous architecture, from ancient buildings to Tudor timber-framed cottages and intermixed with more recent additions. They've been carefully designed not to spoil the look of the place and I think they've done a pretty fine job. At one point along this route there was a toll gate where travellers would pay to access the road that crossed the River Ada. Still visible, however, on its promontory is that lonesome gatehouse wall keeping a flinty eye on the inhabitants of Bramber. Let's enjoy then the final stroll around the village that Charles II beat a retreat in 1651 when he made his way to Shoreham after the Battle of Worcester.
Well, that's another walk done, another investigation, another exploration of some of Britain's history. I hope you enjoyed it and that you'll join me again when I go out on another walk, taking whatever cameras I have available with me. Until then, goodbye.